other uh, a point that I'd like to talk to you about is actually literary analysis, because yes. I'm observing a lot of this in school. I've taught it for 25 years. Uh, how, what, what are your thoughts on that? You know, so what, what's happening a lot in lessons that I'm seeing is students are being presented with a poem, or like today I saw a poem and, uh, and a piece of writing, often quite difficult pieces that they struggle to understand. And they're being asked to sort of look at the use of alliteration or the use of rhyme and rhythm without, in my view, really having an adequate understanding of what the poem's about and that kind of thing. So I just, any thoughts on sort of, you know, literary analysis? Indeed. Um, the major, there are two major problems, as I see it, with the kind of analysis we ask yeah. uh, students to do with poetry in particular. One is the effectiveness paradigm, yeah. which is that we know that there's stuff that poets and writers do, yeah. and therefore, because it's a good piece, we assume it's effective for yeah. all readers, and then the job that the teacher then puts onto the student is show why it's effective. Yeah, and that's so often the question, isn't well, it? Well, and yeah. it's prejudged. It's yeah. said, look for the alliteration, yeah. show why it's effective. Yeah. Why Meanwhile, is this effective? Poor student yeah. is sitting there thinking, well, I don't know why it's effective. And, <laughs> and anyway, really what does... <laughs> what does yeah alliteration do you know there is this weird argument yeah. that if you alliterate with the letter yeah. m that means that you're sleepy or something yeah. and if you alliterate with the letter s you're angry but i mean there is no connection between sound yeah. and emotion yeah. yes i mean poets may try it but more often than not alliteration yeah. isn't in order to secure the effect of an emotion yeah. it's in order to tie bits of language yeah. together because poets are obsessed they may not yeah. call it this but with cohesion yeah. how do i make these chunks of language yeah. stick together so that they're attractive and interesting and involve the reader yeah. alliteration is one of many tiny little things yeah. that we may use um, so that's a problem yeah, I mean, I think what we're and talking then, here is about the terminology chase. That mm. Lesson after English lesson often is a chase to find the alliteration, the onomatopoeia, the yeah. metaphors, the similes, and, and this is how they're expected to write their literary analysis. But then on top of that, and maybe this is a sort of broader heading, if you yeah. like, is that there is this sort of general guesswork come so-called analysis, which actually gets back to what is really author intention, yeah. namely what you're doing is saying, oh well, the author did that, the poet did that, yeah. because. Yeah. Now, you know, nearly, whatever it is, in the 1940s, mm. American critics sat about and said, there is no way yeah. we can divine what the author's intention yeah, yeah. is. We might say there is an effect and the author was trying to do it, or not, we have no idea. Yeah. We may say it had this effect on me, yeah. at least that's coherent and mm. honest. Yeah. Now, so what are we left with for school well, students? I, mean, I, suggest, yeah. Yeah, I suggest several things. But the first connection point that is of use in a terms of analysis yeah. is looking at this text in front of me, does it connect with any other texts that I know of? So I'll start yeah. off with me. Yeah. Okay, now English teachers may find this odd yeah. or strange yeah. because you may end up with The Simpsons. Yeah. You may end up yeah. with with a comic, you may mm. end up with a with a fairy tale. Yeah, it is all game. indeed, yeah. but it is all valid as a yeah. starting point because it yeah. locates this thing in the world of texts. This is intertextuality, yeah. and, and, and then, also I would say just to add, it, it's a context of reading, isn't it? It's what you're bringing to the text. It's your context and how you absolutely. connect with it. Yeah. You have to give time to explore this because you never know what exciting yeah. and interesting things will come up. I'll give one yeah. example. The famous Langston Hughes poem called I Too Sing America. Yeah. I Too Sing America is basically about uh, a man or a woman, I suspect a man, who talks about uh, the fact that he's excluded from a meal when yeah. the folks come over. And then the second verse simply says, next time folks come over, I will join them. Mm. Now I've shared this with many teenagers and I can remember one small group, they were, they were white, Langston Hughes, as we know, is African American, and they got very angry with the poem because they said this is exactly what happens at home with me. I'm a teenager, what happens? We get friends over, my parents get friends over, what do I do? I have to go and eat somewhere else. Yeah. And they said that's what the poem's yeah, about. Yeah. And they carried on like this. Yeah. And then they saw this title and went back to it, I Too Sing America, and suddenly yeah. one of the boys stood up and said, I know what this is, 
this is Martin Luther King. This is I Had a Dream. And then he recited a bit of I Had a Dream. Yeah. Now, you looked at that group of kids, I think they were yeah, year eight. Yeah. You would no more think in, yeah. in, in, in a month of Sundays that that yeah. text was in that boy's head necessarily. Yeah. But it was, and he related yeah. it to that. And I would argue he's got yeah. to a central core meaning of that by giving space mm. for them to explore their teenage texts. In other words, yeah. why do I get sent to the bedroom when my yeah. guests come over? Now, then we look at the text and say, we could have a go at thinking about what text this person yeah. might have known of. Now, let's yeah. have a look. Where does this person come from? Oh, yeah. he's African-American. What type of period yeah. did he live through? He lived through such and such yeah. a period. He died in 1962. We could sit on the computer. We say, look, Harlem yeah. Renaissance. We could give our students notes. Yeah. And then say, well, you know, what kinds of things can we find out? And obviously yeah. teachers are quite capable of providing some of the materials. So the notion that readers have intertexts and yeah. then the author has intertext, and suddenly yeah. we are dealing with yeah. critical analysis. Yeah. We are dealing with it. And then we get to the next stage, which is transforming sources, yeah. which is a powerful thing. Take Harry Potter. Yeah. And you can start with that as an yeah. example of analysis. You say, well, hang on, Harry Potter, there seems to be like two kinds of story going on here. What would you say they yeah. are? So we've got the school story, we've got yeah. the fantasy. She married the two. Can we think of any other school stories? Yeah. Can we think of any other fantasy stories? So how has she created something new yeah. from those two sources? Yeah. That's the fundament of literature, mm. transforming sources. Yeah. So if you can introduce students to that process, yeah. All right, now all that other technical stuff mm. about the alliteration metaphor, I have another suggestion. I call it the secret strings. Okay. Okay. So, poetry, in my mind, is a specialised form yeah. of cohesion. Okay. That's to say, poets have spent three, four, five thousand years trying to find out new and interesting ways yeah. of sticking words together. So we go, yeah. what's that? So we hear it, whether yeah. it's Shakespeare or whoever. We hear a bit and we go, that sounds interesting. Mm. Be nice to your turkeys at Christmas, says Benjamin yeah. Zephaniah. What? Be nice to your turkeys at Christmas? You know? Yeah. What is it? It's, you know, he's got the sort of yeah. order, the command, and all the rest of it. So we hear those. That's what poets try to do. Now, if you have the text of a poem on a nice big piece of paper, yeah. and you put a loop around any sound, any letter mm. sound, yeah. any word, any phrase that you yeah. think links to another word, sound, phrase, or whatever, yeah. You do a line, and then you've got to justify it to your partner. Yeah. So if I say that he says in uh, Stop All the Clocks, yeah. that it says Stop All the Clocks, and then it says st Cut Off the Telephone, yeah. if I notice these are all orders, mm -hmm. then I, I'm allowed to do a loop. And yeah. when somebody says, what do you mean stop and cut off? Why have you connected those two? I say, well, they're both orders. Right. I've spotted yeah. that. Okay? And we can then do that. We can then link it to the orders that are in the yeah. last verse and the fourth verse and so on. I've spotted that. I may spot sounds that are repeated, in which case I can do that and do the same loop. So I can operate at, broadly speaking, two or three levels. Sound, phrasing or patterning of language or syntax, whatever we want yeah. to call it, but also at the level of image. Yeah. We can point out to school students, look, poets quite often, their poem is, uses a whole set of words to do with the light yeah. or a whole set of words to do with animals, somehow or other, yeah. human beings are described in animal terms. Yeah. So when you look at the poem, you can look also at the level of image links, yeah. and you can put your loops around that. And I say to younger students, I say, you are poetry detectives. Yeah. You will find links, and it's your job yeah. to justify them, and you'll even find some links that the poet himself or herself doesn't know about. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Now then you've got a, a language and a repertoire that the students have yeah. got to say, look what I found, and then yeah. you discuss in the class, and it may be that metaphor and alliteration, all sorts of things will come up, but there will be a language of how that poem stuck together, and then you ask the question, why? And you say, well, why would the poet have made these yeah. figures animaloid? What has that yeah. done? Yeah. And again, now we're in the language of interpretation and analysis, and I would say that if you do the intertextual stuff, and then you do the secret string stuff, you will get to as much of the meaning as possible of the poem, but it belongs yeah. to the students. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, and yeah, that's a lot to think about. There. But I if mean, you yeah, do it the other way around, if you got, it's basically it's about context of reading first of all, isn't it? And mm. what the, the, for you, the reader. For the, you, the reader, what's bringing to you? Then it's the context of writing, which is what the 
the, the, the poet, the sorts of situations that produced the poem. And then it's about kind of interrogating, asking questions of the text, isn't it? And Let's say, for example, yeah. with the Romantic poets, you want to cover the notion of nature. Yeah. What was the view of nature that the Romantic yeah. poets did? So, of course, you can come into a class and you can yeah. give a little lecture about romantics and the, the yeah. Romantic poets and nature, and nature and the Romantics, and you know that, what, 5% will get a yeah. lot from it, 10 or 15% will get a bit from it, and yeah. a lot of the others really won't get a lot from it, yeah. apart from just saying the Romantics love nature and yeah. nature loves the Romantics and not a lot more. Yeah. Now, there may be other ways of doing it that will give them more yeah. access. So, for example, obviously, if you look at two or three texts alongside the poem that yeah. talk about nature and get, them, get the students to talk about how what is, these people are saying about nature at that time yeah. might apply to something in the poems. It may yeah. or may not. That, that obviously then gives them a chance to analyse the relationship yeah. between the, the textual life that those writers lived in. You know, I mean, a classic that I've seen people do, obviously, is look at what Dorothy Wordsworth yeah. wrote alongside what Wordsworth wrote, and that he's yeah. using her text, if you yeah. like, as part of a basis in which he could write. And it's her view of nature that he's partly incorporating into daffodils. Yes? Well, that seems to me very yeah, creative. The letter, and nice. the letter is nice. It's it is the, that Dorothy writes, isn't it? Mm. It's basically, it contains a lot of the poem in it, doesn't it? Indeed, and yeah. then that gives you if you can hand it over to them. Yeah. And I've said, I'm, I'm only repeating I, what I I've seen thinking, teachers actually, do. Maybe this is a good juncture actually to move on to perhaps the the, the final topic we would talk about. Maybe uh, because it's not something we're talking about in the conference, but it's nice to have you talking on video. It's just really the writing of poetry. Um, because it strikes me that one way also into the Romantics might be that you don't really look at any of their poems to begin with at all, but perhaps take some of the kind of inspirations for their work and get students sort of walking out in the fields or whatever, or Absolutely. looking at a tree or, you know, staring at the sky. I mean, any thoughts on that? Just, just moving on to kind of poetic writing now, you know, in the processes that perhaps you go through writing your own poems. Okay, well, let me, let me start with the, yeah. the place that you said yeah. there, which is that, you know, that one of the ways into, say, the Romantic Poets, or indeed the Metaphysicals, or yeah. somebody like that, is to say, well, you could write like that. Yeah. You could write about things like that. So yeah. you could say that, the, you know, the core, let's say you were doing the Metaphysicals, you could say at the core of the Metaphysicals is the idea that you could look at a thing and say all the things that it's yeah. like in, in life in some way or another. Yeah. So famously, you know, John Donne looked at a flea and the flea bit yeah. his lover and bit yeah, him yeah. and then he thought about all the stuff to the do blood with inside the, Exactly, yeah. inside the flea is mixing. Yeah. Wow, it's isn't mixing, that exciting? that means we're married. Yes. And or, therefore I can have sex with you. Exactly. So it was all explained just by looking at the flea. Really? Mark about this flea, he said. Yeah. And again, with the romantics, they keep looking at animals, birds, yeah. landscape, famously, nightingale, that sort of thing and saying, what does this mean, and how am I carried away by it? So obviously we could say to students, well just, you could even give students yeah. a little phrase or a line. Yeah. Look at the beautiful line, after all someone wrote in the whole movie yeah. and play based on it, Tender is the Night. Tender is the Night yeah. uh, comes from Ode to a Nightingale. So you can take yeah. Tender is the Night and say, just imagine, that's your title yeah. of your poem or something, what could you write about Tender really? is the Night? Yeah. Yeah. And then, hey, Look at it, it's in the middle of this poem. This bloke's getting excited yeah, about yeah. a nightingale. Yeah. Why would you be excited about a nightingale? Because look at all the things he's connecting it yeah. with. Sounds a little bit as if he's getting high on a nightingale. You know, yeah, he's yeah. You know, way, I'm away into yeah. the, into the, with the fairies here. So that is a, another way in exactly as you say. Now for me, writing, it, it has several starting points. Yeah. The core starting point, I can't get away from it, is the yeah. fact that I read poetry. Yeah. So in my head, are ways of writing poems. 